Well, good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you this morning and welcome those watching on the live stream. It's good to be back. Lisa and I took a few weeks off and uh, went to some warm tropical place and uh, I am having a, a difficult time acclimating. It is cold here. Anyway, not that I'm expecting you to give me any sympathy whatsoever, but um, can I just say this is a great place to come back to. You know what? This is a great place to come back to. I, I love coming back here. I say it almost every time I go on vacation. I also am so appreciative of the team and the staff that God has put together that allows me to take place. Yes. And I know like Pastor Sam and Pastor Kurt, they filled in while I was gone. I know they don't want any credit. I'm going to give them credit anyway. Okay. Um, they did a wonderful job. So we just thank him for filling in. Would you do that? Huh? Thank him. Huh? They do a tremendous job. So does the rest of the team. And uh, we are just incredibly blessed because of the team that God has assembled here at Foothills. And uh, I just don't ever want to take that for granted because uh, it is an, just an incredible blessing. So today we get to start a brand new series and I am excited about the series that we are going to begin building a life that God will bless. How do we do that? And so... One of the most common prayers, I think, that people pray is asking that God would bless them in some way. I mean, Lord, would you bless my marriage? Would you bless my kids? Would you bless my work? Would you bless my finances? Would you bless my health? I mean, it's just, it's, it's a common prayer. Often we request God's favor, his blessing, his help in some way. But is there a way to actually live that, that guarantees God's blessing upon my life. That I don't just hope for it or I think I might have it, but actually guarantees the blessing of God on our life. I can, I can literally build my life this way. You know, the Bible talks about several places that we can take refuge under the shelter of his wings. Not that God has wings, but it's imagery that we can, we can live somewhere under his protection. I brought my umbrella just to kind of illustrate this. No, it's not my umbrella. I don't have an umbrella. It's my wife's umbrella. So here we go. Now don't, if anyone's superstitious, just don't because I, I, don't, I don't believe that stuff. Okay. You know, don't open an umbrella indoors. That's just stupid. Anyway, so, anyway, um, I'm using the umbrella to represent we can live under the shelter, under the umbrella of God's blessing, or we can choose to live outside of it. We can live in a way that guarantees the blessing. Or you can live in a way, well, I'm going to bless myself. I'm going to live independently from God. I'm going to live in a way where, you know, I don't know if he's going to bless me or not. So we really can't live here or here. Now, I want you to understand something. It's the umbrella, the covering of his blessing, not the bubble. Because a lot of people, you know, they might tell you, oh, you know, follow Jesus and everything's perfect. Not, okay? An umbrella, I like the umbrella imagery because it's, we're still, we're still exposed to the environment in this world. Blessing doesn't mean perfect. Blessing doesn't mean pain-free. Blessing doesn't mean challenge. That's, that's not, when we, say, when we say blessing, this is not what we're talking about. I can live under the shelter. I can live, I can live in a way that places me under the shelter of God's protection and his blessing, but it's still, we still have to live in this broken world. We live in a broken world, a broken environment. We live with broken people and I got to deal with my own brokenness, Right? So, so don't, don't, I mean, I want you to understand what reality is. We can have a level of blessing and protection in our lives, or you could have none. And so what this series is about, how do we orient our lives? How can we position our lives where we can, we can actually build it with blessing? Live our lives, build our lives in a way that God will bless. Now James gives us, the book of James gives us a, a very clear example of how we do this. Verses 22 to 25, look what it says. But don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says. Otherwise you're only fooling yourselves. And great is the fooling that goes on, folks, in churches. None of you, but elsewhere it happens all the time. Okay? For if you listen to the word of God and don't obey, don't follow, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself. And that's what the word of God does. It reveals who we really are. Sometimes that's not pleasant. 
And then we walk away, forget what you look like, so you ignore the word of God. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, that's the, the God's word, the Bible. If you look at that, it sets you free. And if you do what it says, you don't forget what you heard, there it is, then God will bless you for doing it. God will bless you for the doing, not the knowing. He blesses the doing. Building our lives with, with obedience to God's word results in blessing. That's the promise. This is the life that God will bless. It's guaranteed. Jesus said the same thing. He used a little bit different wording. Luke 6, he says, I'll show you what it's like when somebody comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. And then he goes on and he talks about, you know, two people, wise and a foolish person. The foolish person builds their life on the sand and, and they do it their own way. And then when the hard times come and storms come, it destroys their life and what they built is destroyed. But the person who builds their life on obedience to what Jesus said is like building your life on a solid rock. And when the storms come, notice that both get storms. Your life is still standing. That's the blessing. The phrase that we say here all the time at Foothills, obedience equals blessing. Obedience equals blessing. Men and women, I don't ever want you to get tired of hearing it. I cannot. I cannot explain to you how passionate I am about that truth and that principle being sown into your life. I want that for all of you. I want that to ring in your head, your heart. I want you to be standing at the threshold of making decisions. And I want, you, I want my voice in your head, not really my voice, but I want you to hear Jesus going, obedience equals blessing. Because, because that's what the word of God says. So for the next seven weeks, we are going to look at seven areas of obedience. Seven areas of following. Seven biblical behaviors that really define following Jesus. Because we say this all the time. You know, it's all about following Jesus. But what does that look like? We are going to describe it. We're going to define it. We're going to look at these seven biblical behaviors, characteristics, qualities that just need to be part of our lives. That will orient us in a way that God promises to bless. So that's what the series is all about. That's where we're going to go. So today we start with the very first one. We're going to talk about prayer today. Now I know that here in this church we've talked about prayer so many times. And because sometimes it's a familiar topic, please, I, I am asking that you hear it differently today. I'm asking that God gives you new ears and new eyes that you hear it in a fresh way. Because, because folks, it's, it is that important. And I want to talk about very practical things so that we can take steps to do this as we leave today. So how do I build my life with prayer? Not just pray. Build my life with prayer. That's kind of a big deal. So here we go. Four things I want to share with you. Number one is this. If you're going to build your life with prayer, it means lifestyle. We, we, we have to look at prayer as a lifestyle, not a thing. Ephesians 6, 18, look at this. This is lifestyle. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion, stay alert, be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Well, that's kind of all inclusive. The behaviors that we repeat in a consistent way, that represents our lifestyle. We work consistently. We parent, we go to school, we exercise, we, we watch our, our forms of social media and our devices. We listen to music and the list could go on. These things that we repeat over and over again, those things really represent our lifestyle. God's word tells us that prayer needs to be one of these actions. Prayer is so important that we should learn how to pray at, at all times. Be ready for it at all times, on every occasion, not, not just not just at church, not just at bedtime, not just at mealtime. And if you do those things, that's wonderful. And, and I don't mean to, to throw any discouragement if that's what your prayer life looks like. Fantastic. It's just, now I want you to take a step forward. I want you to go beyond that. If prayer is ever to become a lifestyle for us, it's going to have to include two issues, time and consistency. Time and consistency. 
Whatever we give our time to, we repeat over and over again. It creates lifestyle. It creates habits. And that's another way to look at these things that I'm going to be talking about in the next seven weeks. These are, these are biblical lifestyle habits that we have to integrate into our life. That God says, I will bless this if you live this way. So let me explain a little bit how to do prayer as a lifestyle. How do we do prayer as a lifestyle? Because everything that we're going to talk about in, in the next seven weeks, we have to do. I mean, we can't just, you know, c- come out of here and go, well, that was cool. You, you're not, we're not blessed when we know. We're blessed when we do. So how do we do it? So here you go. Here's some practical things. I didn't have enough to put all this in your notes. And so you might want to write some of these things down so that you have action steps when you leave here today. Because I have a passion for application if you didn't know that already. I want you to understand God's word, but I have a passion for you to do God's word. So here you go. First of all, create a specific daily time. A specific time during the day. Set aside enough time so you don't feel in a hurry or you don't feel rushed. And and so I know some of you, well, pastor, I I pray throughout the day. That's fantastic. If you pray throughout the day, you've already are incorporating some of these things into your lifestyle. Prayer is already a lifestyle. That's wonderful. Please don't discourage people who aren't there yet, okay? And sometimes the way you develop a habit is to set aside a time to do it. And you do it over and over again. So set aside a time. I realize those of you that are raising uh, kids and your parents or your mom, your moms. And I mean, my wife used to tell me that, that the only time she could find uninterrupted time to pray was when she took a shower in the morning. Because when you're taking care of littles, it's hard to find time to be alone. But find it. Do it anyway. If maybe guys or somebody else or, or whoever commutes to work, pray on your commute. Pray on your way home. Set aside a consistent time to pray. You're going to feel forces against you to try to stop you from doing this because it's a lot harder than you think. And in a few moments, I get towards the end of my message, I'm going to talk about what those forces really are that are keeping you from this. Develop a list of specific issues and people to pray about. Creating lists is not unspiritual. In fact, it helps us pray. It helps us focus our prayers. It helps us pray on point. I have all kinds of lists. Some of those lists are in front of me. Some of those lists are in my head. But I pray through lists. I'm organized when I pray. I pray for my marriage. I pray for my wife. I pray for my kids. I pray for my son-in-laws. I pray for my grandchildren. I pray for you. You create, you write your prayer request on that blue card. I pray for you. That's not lip service. We pray for you. It's a list. It will be tabulated tomorrow morning and I will see those prayer requests and the praying begins. Okay? I pray for the church. I pray for my team. I pray for the staff. I pray for the town. I, I have lists. Create a list. It also helps you see answers when you have a list and then God shows up. Oh, it's easy to see those answers to those prayers. Allow circumstances throughout the day to prompt you to pray. Don't let prayer now just be compartmentalized to a specific time. Now you've got your specific time, fantastic. Go beyond it. Let God prompt you to pray throughout the day. Well, what do you mean? Because some of you, this is new. God will allow you, I love this phrase, I didn't coin it, somebody else did. You pray on site with insight. So you're somewhere, you're a safe way or, or you know, somewhere getting groceries and you see someone struggling. You see a mom with two kids or three kids and they're having a meltdown in the aisle. You see the checker having a bad day and somebody yells at them. Those are prompts. Use those to pray for that person. Pray into their situation. You go, well, it's none of my business. I know, but you're a follower of Jesus. And you're there in that moment. And it wasn't an accident. You're there seeing that, witnessing that. And it's time for us to pay attention as followers of Jesus and be prompted to pray into these situations. And you will be amazed once you start opening yourself up to that. There's a lot of ways to pray during the day. Your boss is having a bad day. Pray for your boss, okay? You're thinking, I don't want to. Which is the next thing? Pray regardless of feelings, all right? Sometimes I don't want to pray. Oh, pastor, you're a, I mean, you're a pastor. Don't you always want to pray? No. Sometimes I'm tired. Sometimes I'm weary. Sometimes I'm distracted. Sometimes I'm angry. Sometimes I'm discouraged, just like you. 
And so what am I going to do? Set aside prayer? God knows how you feel anyway. So I talk to him about my feelings. Lord, I'm just struggling today. I don't really feel like prayer, like praying, but you know that. So, but I'm going to pray anyway. I'm going to try to, I'm going to go pray. I'm going to grab my list. Boy, that's when the list really matters. When you just don't want to pray, you're having trouble focusing, grab your list. Pray through your list. Pray regardless of feelings. Building your life with prayer means lifestyle. Now, the second one is so important. If you can get the next thing I'm going to talk about, it will change your relationship with Jesus completely. Build your life on prayer. It means connecting. Connecting. Jesus said this in John 15. It, it is so important for us to understand what Jesus is saying here. John 15, 5, understand the imagery. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Do you understand the significance? I am the vine, okay? Everything's coming through the vine. You're connected to me. Those who remain in me, stay connected in me, and I and them will produce much fruit. There's the blessing. Your life will be fruitful in ways you can't even imagine. For apart from me, you can do, let's say the word together. Nothing. Nothing. That is hard for us to believe. And re we wrestle with that. Prayer helps me connect to the power source of my life. There is a power source in you. When you give your life to Jesus, he lives inside of you. His spirit lives in you. That is the power source of your life. The power source of your life is not you. I brought this power strip to illustrate this, this simple principle, okay? This power strip, it's a wonderful thing. Your life's like this power strip. This power strip is designed to be plugged into a larger power source. Once it is plugged into a power source, it is very, very useful. But by it itself, well, it's, it's pretty powerless. What I see people do all the time, Christians do all the time, they're trying to live out their Christian life like this. They plug into themselves. And then they don't understand why their prayers don't work. They don't understand why they have no motivation to pray, no motivation to serve, why there's no joy in their life. And then, and then they get upset with God because they feel like God isn't fulfilling his part of the deal. All the while, Jesus says, if, if you remain in me, no, I think I'll do this instead. Okay? Folks, I'm telling you, this is make or break. If you learn how to plug into Jesus and what he said in John 15, 5, it will change your life. So many people, they just, they, they dare I say, the majority of Christendom is trying to live like this. This just creates more guilt, more shame, more doubt, and all kinds of bad more things, right? Uh, without this connection to Jesus, Jesus said, we can do nothing. My power has to flow through you. This understanding, this is understanding the significance of your prayers. Now this is, listen to this. We pray being connected to the power source. We pray being connected this is what creates the power in our praying. Our prayers only have power because we pray connected. Your service only has power because you serve connected. Plenty of people pray, but that doesn't mean there is power behind their praying. We have to pray in fellowship, in connection with Jesus. We pray remaining to him, connected to him, in sync with him. That's what produces the fruit. That's what produces the blessing. We, we live in this constant connection with him. Therefore, when we pray, we have to make sure we're connected. Not just praying, but praying connected. There's a difference. So how do we do that? How do I pray connected? Because when you learn how to pray connected, then you start living connected. Then you serve connected. I mean, I, I gotta tell you, I don't ever want to walk up on this platform without being connected to Jesus. Ever. Ever. So I make sure I'm connected. I don't want to show up at the office tomorrow morning without being connected, ever. 
Because it's not going to go well. Because without him, I can do nothing. So how, okay, so how do we do that? Okay, here you go. Some practical things. And the first word is confession. We, we confess sin. Sin in our lives can short circuit the connection with Jesus. That's what it does. It doesn't ruin your relationship. He still loves you. You're still going to heaven. You're still saved. All that stuff is, is, is true. But what this does, this is what sin does. When you're connected to Jesus, you're walking in step with him. Sin is basically choosing my path versus his path. It doesn't have to be some horrible thing. It's just, you know what? I'm not going to trust you, follow you in some way, attitude, thought, behavior, words. And I unplug and I start living life like this. That's sin. Oh. So, every day, Lord, I want to confess where I unplugged from you. I want to confess where I did my own thing. This isn't about groveling. It's not about shame. It's not about judgment. No, it's about connecting. Lord, I, I know I unplugged. I, I know I, I said this mean thing. I, I treated somebody unlovingly. I, I got angry, lost my temper. Lord, will, will you forgive me? Oh, absolutely, you're forgiven. I just need to, I need to reconnect with you. Done, connected. Daily be aware of your heart. We need to daily be aware of your heart. This daily, daily confession will help you with this. Daily confess your sinful attitudes. Folks, don't wait till you come to church to think about this. this is, you have to think about your heart every day. You have to think about your, your, your connection every day. Jesus is not going to ask us to do something that we cannot understand whether or not we're doing it. When he says, remain in me, we must have the ability to understand whether I'm remaining and connecting or not. If I asked you a question this morning, you don't have to answer it. Are you remaining in Jesus at this moment, right now, or not? Yes or no? And some of you are like, I have no idea. That's a growth area then. You should be able to know whether you are connected or not. Because it's a command. Well, he would not command something we could not do. So daily be aware of what's going on inside. And then grow your awareness of the connection. All right, just, just what I said, the more you do this, the more it will become a habit, the more you'll be aware of what is going on inside of you and you'll be able to tell. So there when you pray, and sometimes when I pray, I start with confession. I just go, Lord, I wanna expose my heart to you. I want my heart right. And so I just start with some heart conversations with God just to make sure that thing is where it needs to be. So then I know when I step into prayer, it matters. All right. Building your life on prayer means connecting. Those of you that serve here at Foothills, I want to encourage you before you ever show up on a Sunday morning or one other night to serve or day or wherever you're serving, show up connected. Pray on your way in. Look at your heart. It'll change how you serve as well. All right, number three. Building your life on prayer means dependency. Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. That, that, is a, that is a statement that we are depending on God. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he's done. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, oh, just these two verses are, I love these two, the simplicity. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. See, this, this is describing dependency, what it looks like. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Dependency is believing that Jesus is the power source of your life. He is the only one we depend on and trust, not ourselves. Dependency is truly believing that without this constant connection, you do not have what it takes. This isn't beating yourself up. This isn't selling yourself short. This isn't bad self-esteem. It's just that you do not have what it takes to be everything that Jesus wants you to be by yourself. You do not. And the sooner we come to that realization the more dependent we'll be. This is why pride and dependency do not go together. I dare say that so many Christians are simply too prideful to pray with this much desperation. They still believe that they can handle many things by themselves. Our pride and self-sufficiency is our greatest enemy to prayer. Pride and prayer do not go together. To build your life with prayer is to grow in your dependency and your desperation in God. 
I want to choose desperation and dependency. I don't, want, I don't want to have to have painful circumstances to force me to go there. Because that'll happen anyway. I want to choose it before they show up. So how do we grow in dependency? So here's what I want to do. I want to take Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. We're going to break it down and, and use those four statements on how we learn how to depend on God every day. Here you go. First of all, daily tell God you trust him. Daily tell God you trust him. That's what it says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Oh, I do. Do you? Have you told him lately? Well, what do you mean? It says trust him. God's going, hey, trust me. Do you ever tell him you trust him? I, I say this to God all the time. All the time. Lord, I trust you. When things are hard, when things are painful, when things happen that I don't understand, when I'm confused, I don't know what to choose, I don't know what decisions to make, I don't know how to lead. Lord, I trust you. Because that's what you tell me to do. I trust you. I say it out loud. Why? Because sometimes my heart needs to hear it. I trust you. Trust the Lord with all your heart. When was the last time you told the Lord you'll trust him? And then stop trying to figure it out yourself. So it says, do not depend on your own understanding. I got to figure this out. No, stop. Doesn't mean that you're not smart. Doesn't mean that you aren't educated. Doesn't mean that you aren't intelligent. It just means that what you know is too limited to make complete conclusions. You don't know everything. So stop trusting yourself entirely. Do not, it says, do not depend on your own understanding. He's God. He sees your life from first day to the last day. He sees all the details. He sees things that you don't. Don't trust yourself. Huh. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Your understanding is too limited. But pastor, I got to figure this out. No. You need to be led out. And that might be new for some of you. The third thing it says, tell God you'll do whatever he leads you to do. Why would I say that? Because it says seek his will in all you do. Seek his will in all you do. Seek his will. Not what you want. So will you tell the Lord, I will do whatever you show me to do. I'll do whatever you say. And I have said this so many times at Foothills, I'm going to say it again. You tell the Lord yes in advance before you get his answer. Because if you are unwilling to tell the Lord yes in advance, you are still hanging on to veto power for what he's asking you to do. And you're going to evaluate whether you want to do it or not. So why don't you just go full in. Lord, I'll do whatever you say. I'll do whatever you say. And if we'll depend on God like that, you see what the blessing is? Here's the blessing. What was it say? Who show you which path to take? Oh, look at that. Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice to be led? Wouldn't it be nice to have God show you what to do? Wouldn't it be nice to have God help you through life and lead you through? That's the promise. And yet, how often do we live like this and we demand that God lead us? All right, number four. One more. Building your life on prayer means warfare. Warfare. Prayer is one of the most important ways we engage in the spiritual battle that we are involved in. I realize for some of you, this may be a brand new concept. Some of you, it's not. Some of you are going, good, you're talking about this. Others are like, what are you talking about? And I don't want to alarm you in any way, but the reality is that we are involved in a war between angelic and demonic forces. The conflict between God and Satan is real. It's not just for Hollywood. Please don't get your theology from Hollywood. Let's stick with the Bible, okay? And the Bible is crystal clear on this issue. Crystal clear. There's spiritual conflict going on. So I want to give you just a brief little window into this. The Bible does this every once in a while. The book of Daniel is one of those places. I went through this a couple months ago in my, in my Bible class. It is a fascinating passage. Daniel is a prisoner in Persia. 
He's a Jewish godly man. He's praying. He wants understanding about something specific. And then he has a visit from an angel. Now I want you to understand, I'm going to read this passage to you. But we are going to get some insight. Daniel 10. Then he said, the angel said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before God, your request has been heard in heaven. But he's been praying for 21 days. I have come in answer to your prayer, but for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Excuse me? The message, the answer was sent on day one, and he got hung up for 21 days because someone wouldn't let him through. Then Michael, one of the archangels, we're talking about angels now, came to help me. I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. What is going on? A few verses later, he says, the angel replied, do you know why I have come? Soon I must return to fight against the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. And after that, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Greece will come. We had this little porthole into the, this angelic conflict between good angels and evil angels. This is fascinating. And I don't have time to really dig into this this morning, but let me give you some bullet points that we understand very clearly from the word of God. Here you go about angels and demons. Satan and demons are fallen angels who oppose the purposes of God on planet earth. It's real, folks. That is what God's word teaches. There is also a battle for geographic political control over earth and humanity. When you look at the global conflict, when you look at political chaos, when you see what is going around this world, you see Russia and Putin and Ukraine and China, there is way more going on than simply countries who hate each other and there's ideology, ideological differences. There is a spiritual conflict going on for the control of planet earth and for people who are made in the image of God. Demons and angels have geographic assignments. What? Well, that's what it said. The spirit prince of Persia, Greece. They were assigned, powerful angels, assigned over geographic areas. Well, are there demons assigned to our geographic area? You can count on it. You can count on it. Here's the exciting part, okay? Our prayers play a part in God's plan on earth. And in the warfare between God's kingdom and Satan's, our prayers matter. Our prayers matter. Do you realize Daniel's praying and an angel was sent? I mean, it's kind of cool to think that our prayers can, can influence angelic assignments. I mean, I'm not sure how it all works, folks. But all I know is what scripture says. That when we pray, and this is why you got to pray connected. We're involved in this. Our prayers matter. Our prayers influence. Our prayers change things. This is why you feel such resistance to develop prayer in your life. I'm over all the things that you're going to feel resistance over, you're going to feel resistance here. Why is it so hard to be motivated to pray? This is why. He hates it when you pray. He does not care if you go to church. Maybe he cares a little bit. Anyway, so he gets all worked out when you want to start praying. Because you sit here and listen to this and do nothing. What does he care? Again, it's in the doing where there's power, where there's blessing, where things change. The last thing the enemy wants you to do is start praying and make that a lifestyle. I'm trying. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap this up. Application time. I want to ask you to join the fight. I want to ask you to join the fight. You say, why? Because you're part of the conflict whether you choose to engage or not. You're either going to be a warrior or a prisoner. You don't get to be spiritual Switzerland, okay? A neutral country. I'm just going to be neutral. You don't get that. You're either going to get involved in the fight or be taken captive. That, that's it. That's the only two options you have. He's calling us to partner with him to transform communities that the enemy has controlled far too long, folks. So let me be transparent. We, I, I believe that we do not have enough, we do not have enough praying 
in this church for where Jesus is leading us. That's not a, that's not a guilt trip. It's just a, the fact that Jesus is leading us into his work of transformation. And that means strongholds are going to be, we're going to come up against. That means the enemy is going to be confronted. We, we, we believe that he wants to change things. And that's not going to make the enemy happy. And we don't have enough prayer to go where he's leading us to go. Malala needs to be transformed. Colton, Malino, Beaver Creek, wherever you live. The past couple of years, just as a church, let me be transparent here. We've taken a lot of hits from the enemy. they have been some hard years. Last two to three years, I'm going to say have been some of the hardest years of ministry I've ever faced. I cannot do this job alone. Yes, we have a great team at Foothills, but we, our team, cannot do this alone either. We need you to pray with us. And we need you to pray with us like never before. We need to pray for our communities like never before. See, the imagery we have in God's word is, is, is a city is surrounded by a wall called the wall of righteousness. And there's gaps in the wall. Look at this passage in Ezekiel. I'm going to finish with this. It says, I look for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. Righteousness guards the land. That's why the Bible says by the blessings of the upright, a city is exalted. It's, it's the righteous. I search for someone to stand in the gap in the wall. See, walls protect and there's gaps. The enemy's coming in. And so I searched for someone to stand in the gap in the wall so I wouldn't have to destroy the land. But I found no one. God is saying he doesn't want to bring discipline. But unless the spiritual wall of righteousness is rebuilt and the gaps are enclosed, there is no other path but judgment. It feels like this is a path our entire country is on. Unless. Unless. And may God never look at our area, our city, where we live, and say, I looked. I looked for people who would build up the wall of righteousness, but I found none. May that never be said about us. And so let's stand in the gap together. Let's stand in the gap together. That's the call. So in your, uh, your handouts, if you didn't get one of these, you can get one on your way out. There's a prayer card. So can we pull that out and we're going to wrap up with this. I want to ask you, as we are developing a, building your life with prayer, that we would up our game collectively to pray for your church and pray for your community more than we ever have. Now, I can ask you to do that, but I want to give you practical ways to do that. And so on one side, you know, how to pray for your church staff and leaders. So there you go. If you don't know them by name, you can go to our website. You can pull up leaders. You can pull up volunteer leaders. You can pull up our elders. Folks, we need you to pray for us. And in saying that, I, I'm not assuming, I mean, some of you do, and I'm so thankful. And you pray for your church, and I'm so thankful. But we need more. We just need more. And I will not, I will not be so prideful to stand up here and say that I don't need you to pray for me. And that we don't need you to pray for us. We do. We do. The backside is your community. How do you pray for a community? It is time for us to stop complaining about our communities and start interceding for them and start praying for them and start building the wall and stand in the gap. Are they messed up and do they have problems? Of course they do. But God has entrusted these communities to us. As I drive through town, I drive through all of the the. The, the building, the housing, the apartments going up, the, the businesses that are in Malala. This community is going to, it has radically changed. It is going to radically change in the next five to 10 years. God is entrusting people to us. 
And that is how we need to see it. And that is how we need to pray. Now let's stand in the gap together. Can we do this? Amen? All right. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we all have ways to grow when it comes to prayer. We're going to grow in this for the rest of our life. So wherever we're at on the journey, I pray that we'd say, yes, Lord, I need to grow. I need to keep building my life with prayer. And Lord, I pray that as you look at our city, our communities, our geographic area, and you look at the holes in the wall of righteousness that protects people, that protects a city. May it never be said about us. When you're looking for someone to stand in the gap, I pray that you hear us say, Lord, we got this. With you, we'll stand in the gap. We'll pray. We'll intercede. We'll love. We'll feed people. We, we will bless this city the way you've called us to. I pray that we would fulfill our role I ask, Lord, that we would learn how to pray connected. Not just go through the, the routine of prayer, but understand what's really taking place. We are engaged in a battle. Lord, I pray that your church would step into it. And I pray strongholds fall. I pray that, that things that used to define this community would never define it again. You said the gates of hell will not prevail. All right, Lord, let's go kick some gates. Let's go see him fall in Jesus' name. And let's see people set free. That's what we're here to do. So, Lord, we trust you. We trust you. Now show us how to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you guys.